the sum rule says that if we have two functions, f and g, and they're both differentiable, then when we add them together, that new function, f plus g, is also differentiable. And the uh, derivative of that function will be f prime plus g prime. Okay, and we'll, I mean, it seems a little bit abstract now, but we'll look at what an example of that is in a second. And similar for subtraction. Okay, so when you take two functions that are differentiable and you add them together, the derivative is just the derivative of each of each added together. When you subtract two functions that are differentiable, the derivative of that is just the derivative of each or the difference of the derivative of each. Okay, so as an example, if I look at this function, f of x equals 6 x to the 5 plus 2 square root of x, find f prime of x. Well, I could treat each one of these as a separate function. Okay, this could be g of x, this could be h of x. And then what I know is that f prime of x is just the derivative of each of these terms. Okay, so this is what this rule basically tells me. If I have a function where I am adding different terms together, I can just find the derivative of each term. Okay, as long as each of those terms is differentiable. Okay, so for this guy, and we'll talk about that piece about being differentiable in a second, okay, because that comes up actually in this example. Um, what's going on here? My smart board's acting up again. Okay, for this guy, Okay, f of x equals 6x to the 5 plus 2 square root of x. Well, we're probably going to want to rewrite the square root of x in exponential form. So f of x, oh, let's do that. Oh, I did do that. What's happening here? That's better. 6x to the 5 plus 2 times x to the 1 half. So I'll do that. Okay, then the derivative f prime of x is just going to be, well, I have to take this guy, bring it in front. So 6 times 5 is 30. x, decrease that by 1 to the 4. Okay, plus the derivative of this piece. So 2 times a half times x to decrease that by one would be to the negative one half. Okay, and I'm just going to clean this up a little bit, the second term anyway. 30x to the four, and then this is one, two times a half is one, times x to the negative one half x to the negative one half is one over x to the one half. Okay. So this becomes that. Okay. Now, do you have to write that as 1 over the square root of x, or can you leave it as 1 over x to the 1 half? You can leave it either way. However, personally, when I write it in radical form, it helps me to think more about what is the domain, where is this differentiable? Okay, now if I look at just this piece, 6x to the 5, where is that differentiable? Or think about continuity. What's the domain of 6x to the 5? f of x equals, or let's say it's g of x equals 6x to the 5. What's the domain of that? Yeah, everything. x can be anything. Okay, so this piece is continuous everywhere. What about this piece, 2 square root of x? Let's say that's h of x, and this is 2 square root, h of x equals 2 square root of x. What's the domain of that? Okay. 
Yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, are you talking about the, the derivative? Okay, almost. I mean, x definitely can't equal zero for the derivative because then you'd be dividing by zero. But this is a radical. It's a square root. Am I allowed to have any value in the square root? What can I have in there? Positive values, yeah. So this piece, right, the domain is x is greater than or equal to zero. This piece, the domain is x is an element of the real numbers. That can be anything. It's continuous everywhere. Okay, so when you have these two pieces, and you want to think about where is this entire thing differentiable, you got to think about that one, the one that's sort of more restrictive. Okay, now remember, the radical functions, there's an end point at zero. And so that's why it's actually not differentiable at zero because we can't draw a tangent line there, right? This one is going to look like this. If I just look at h of x equals 6, x to the 5, it's going to look like that. Okay? And if I look at this guy, g of x equals 2 root x, that's going to look like this. Okay, so this is continuous everywhere. This has a domain of x greater than 0, okay? This one is not differentiable at 0 because how do you draw a tangent line at an endpoint? You can't. There's no slope there, okay? So when we're looking at the derivative, Okay, this is only differentiable for x greater than zero. And when I see it written in radical form as opposed to x to the one half, for me it's easier to remember because I know that I cannot have a negative radicand when I'm taking a square root. I have to have a positive value in there. Okay, now I didn't specifically ask you to tell, like I didn't say, where is this function differentiable? But I think that's a good thing to explore because it's gonna come up uh, in our next unit when we look at curve sketching, which is how do we take all of these functions, their derivatives and their second derivatives and actually build a graph out of all of those pieces, okay? So we have to think about these types of things, okay? Uh, here's another one. Given f of x equals 9x cubed plus 2x squared plus 3x minus 15, find f prime of x. So this one's a little bit more straightforward. This is just a polynomial function, right? The entire thing, if you look at the whole thing, all of the different pieces, are all polynomials. This one's continuous everywhere, so its derivative will also be continuous everywhere, okay? So to find the derivative, we just need to apply that uh, power rule, right? So this is gonna be three times nine is 27, x squared plus two times two is four x, and then plus three. What about the negative 15? What's the derivative of that? Zero, yeah, because the derivative of a constant, so that's a straight line, the slope of that is zero, or a horizontal line, I should say, right? All lines are straight. Horizontal line has a slope of zero, okay? Um, this guy, f of x equals root x minus three all squared. Find f prime of x. Okay, where would you start this? And I'll, I'll tell you what, after Monday's class, we'll have more than one way of doing this. But for now, we only have one thing to do. Yeah. Yes. Expand. Okay, so f of x equals uh, square root of x minus 3x times the square root of x minus 3x. Yeah. So if we expand that, we're going to get x times x equals x, or sorry, Square root of x times the square root of x equals x. And then 
uh, square root of x times negative 3x is minus. Actually, you know what? Before we expand, I'm changing my mind. We can do it this way first, but I'm going to do this. What do you think I'm going to do? What, am I, what do you think I'm going to replace these square roots of x with? Yeah, x to the 1 half. And the reason why is because when I do this, x to the 1 half times 3x to the 1, now I can apply the product rule of exponents and I can add these two exponents together, right? As opposed to having to have 3x times the square root of x, I could still do that after, right? But I want to do that now in one step. So um, let's think about that. 1 plus 1 half is 2 over 2 plus 1 over 2 is 3 over 2, okay? So x, uh, sorry, uh, x to the 1 half times negative 3x to the 1 is minus 3x to the 3 over 2, and then minus another 3x to the 3 over 2, and then plus 9x squared. Okay, so all together we're going to have f of x, equals x minus 6x to the 3 over 2 plus 9x squared. Okay, now we can find the derivative of this. And we will get What is the derivative of just x? Do you guys know what that is? Yeah, it's 1. Because it, it would be like you bring this in front, 1 times x to the 0. And x to the 0 is 1. Yeah, that's right. Okay, And then minus 6 times 3 over 2 x to the 3 over 2 minus, a half, uh, minus 1 rather is to the 1 half, and then plus 9 times 2, x to the 1. Okay, so that all together is just 1. Uh, that's going to be 3 times 3 is minus 9x to the 1 half plus uh, 18x. Okay, so this is, and again, you could convert that into radical form as well if you want to. Where is this function differentiable? Take a look at the derivative. Oh, sorry, f prime of x. And think about what values could you plug in there for x. Take a look at it one term at a time. Yeah. Greater than 0. OK, close. Could we plug a 0 in there? Yeah, you could. It would, this term would just become 0. If you plugged a 0 in there, the derivative would be 1 minus 0 plus 0, which is 1. So actually, in this case, this is differentiable for x greater than or equal to 0. Actually, I should say not this one, but this, the original f of x. Okay. The difference is that here the, the radical is in the numerator, whereas in the previous one, the square root of x was in the denominator. And so if we had a 0 in the denominator, we'd be dividing by 0, and we have an undefined value. If I just have 0, then that's fine. Okay. Can't have negative values, though, because then, again, you know, the square root of a negative value is it's actually called an imaginary number. But... You'll, you'll look at that in three or four years from now, if you, keep it, if you keep looking at math. 
start looking at taking courses that look at imaginary numbers. Okay? Do you guys know what an, the imaginary number is? You've probably heard of them, right? So i is equal to the square root of negative 1. And the cool thing about this is that this doesn't exist, but this does because it's that. So there's actually a lot of sort of applications of imaginary numbers in um, nuclear physics, in astrological physics, in all sorts of stuff. So it's been about 15 years for me, but you guys may be a couple years away from it. Okay, anyway, I'm on a tangent again. Okay, let's do an example. Okay. Find the equation of both lines through the point 2, negative 3 that are tangent to the curve y equals x times x plus 1. Okay. So just to kind of visualize what's going on here, let's draw a rough sketch of this. Um, if we look at this curve, what type of function is this? y equals x times x plus 1. Yeah, quadratic, yeah, because it's got two factors with x in it, right? Okay, this is in factored form. When a quadratic is in factored form, what does that tell us about in terms of the graph? Yeah. Yes, where the x-intercepts are. So I'm going to use that to graph this function. And remember, this is just really a rough sketch. So I know that I have an x-intercept at 0. And I know that I have an x-intercept at negative 1. And I know that the parabola is going to face upwards because the coefficient of x squared is going to be positive, right? This is going to be y equals x squared plus x. So it's going to pass through these two points. Ah, there we go. Roughly what it's going to look like. Okay, now I want to know the equations of both lines through the point 2, negative 3. So the point 2, negative 3 is like down here. Uh, I probably should have done this a little smaller. Can I, you know what? You guys don't need to erase this, but I'm not going to have enough space here. I'm going to squish this in a little bit more. Let's try that again. I'm just making it smaller so that I can fit the whole picture in. OK, so there's 0, negative 1. That's better. So here's 2, negative 3. And essentially, if you sort of sketch it, and you can imagine a line that touches the curve, one of them is going to be somewhere over here. And it, remember that this is a rough sketch, so it's not perfect, but it's somewhere in this area. And the other one, i got to continue this up here somewhere. It's going to be like way up here. They're going to touch. Does that make sense? There's, those are going to be the two lines that pass through this point that are going to be tangent to this curve. Yeah? OK. So let's say that this point over here, we don't know what it is. Let's say that the coefficient of x here is a. What would the y-coordinate be? f of a, and f of a is what's f of a? f of x is x squared plus x. So f of a, a squared plus a. So the y coordinate is a squared plus a. Okay? 
Now, that, that point and this point allows me to get an expression for the slope of this tangent line. The slope of this tangent line is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. y2 is a squared plus a minus y1 is negative 3 over x2 is a minus 2. And that becomes a squared plus a plus 3 over a minus 2. So on the one hand, we have that. The slope of this line is a squared plus a plus 3 over a minus 2. Okay? Now, if we look at y prime, so y equals x squared plus x, what would y prime be? What's the derivative of this function? Yep. 2x plus 1. Okay, I'm using the, the uh, power law here. So to bring this in front, so that's 2x, that decreases by 1. So 2x to the 1, I don't need to put a 1 there, and then plus 1. Okay, so that's the equation of the derivative. And remember, the equation of the derivative represents the slope of the tangent line at any given point of x. Okay. So when x equals a, y prime equals what? y prime is 2x plus 1. So if x equals a, 2a plus 1. And remember, that's a slope. The slope at the tangent, that's the slope of the tangent line of the curve at the point x equals a. So on the one hand, we've got that the slope equals this expression. And on the other hand, we have the slope equals this expression. If we want to find the point a where that happens, we have to set these two equal to one another. Okay, so to get the point A, set the two expressions for slope equal to each other. So we're going to have 2a plus 1 equals that. Now I have to solve this. So how am I going to do that? Yeah. Mm, we could try. I don't think this guy's going to factor, though. That would be something to try, though. Yeah, try and factor for sure. Is that this, I, this is essentially a rational equation, right? So yeah, good idea. Try to factor. But I don't think this will factor. Yes? OK. So we are dividing by a minus 2. Yeah, that's a good thought. How do you undo division by a minus 2? Multiply both sides by a minus 2. OK? If 
by the way, you should remember this from when you looked at rational equations um, last year, that A shouldn't equal 2, right? Because then you have a vertical line. OK. Now we just have a bunch of expansion, and now we're solving a quadratic equation. OK? So here we're going to have uh, 2A squared, and then plus A minus 4A is minus 3A uh, minus 2 equals a squared plus a plus 3. And now we can equate to 0 and factor. Okay. Or if it's not factorable, then how could you solve it algebraically if it's not factorable? Or if you forget how to factor. You guys all know how to factor. I know that. But if you forget how to factor, you could also get the same answer this way. What could you do? This becomes a squared minus 4a minus 5 equals 0. How do you solve a quadratic equation that's unfactorable algebraically? Quadratic formula, yeah. This one's factorable, though, so that's nice. Okay, so multi two things that multiply to negative 5 and add to negative 4. 1 and negative 5. Okay, so we're going to get that A equals negative 1 and 5. All right, so that's good. Those are the two x values on the curve y equals x squared plus x, um, where the tangent line is going to go through this point negative, uh, 2, negative 3, rather. Okay? So I think we were asked the equation of both lines. The equation of both lines. So um, I'm just going to extend this because I'm running out of space. I'm going to continue this down here. If x equals a, if, sorry, if x equals negative 1, then uh, y equals negative 1 squared, um, what was it, plus negative 1, which is 1 plus negative 1 is 0, okay? So my point is negative 1, 0. And what would the slope of my line be when x is negative 1? Slope of my tangent line. How would I get that? There's a number of ways, but one of them is probably the most straightforward at this stage. got an x value of negative 1 on this curve, and I want to know the slope of the tangent at that specific point. What about this? What does the derivative tell us? slope of the tangent at any given value of x. Yeah? Yes? No? Yeah? Okay, cool. So to get the slope is going to be y prime, which is 2 times negative 1 uh, plus 1, which is, what is that? Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. Okay? So to get the equation, y equals mx plus b, y is 0 equals m is negative 1 times x is negative 1 
plus b. So 0 equals 1 plus b. b is negative 1. Okay, so my equation at that point at negative 1, 0, the equation is y equals slope is negative 1x minus 1, or negative x minus 1. Okay, at the other one, if x equals 5, then y is going to equal 5 squared plus 5, which is 25 plus 5 is 30. So my point will be 5, 30. And what will the slope be? When x is 5. Okay, so you could absolutely use this, right? You can get the slope that way. That's one expression for slope, which is basically just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, because we know two points that, that the line passes through. Yeah, so that's absolutely one way to get the slope, okay? We know now, though, about derivatives. And derivatives give us the slope of a tangent at any given point of x. And we know right now that our x value is 5. Right? So the derivative of this function was y prime is 2x plus 1. So if x, x, um, if x is 5, what will the value of the derivative be? because it's going to be 2 times 5 plus 1, which is, uh, yeah, 11, okay? Now, just to follow on what you were saying, if you wanted to use the slope formula, you absolutely could. You know that one point is 530. The other point, right, the points are 530 and uh, 2, negative 3, I think, right? Yes, okay, so you could go m equals negative 3 minus 30 over 2 minus 5, which is negative 33 over negative 3, which is negative, uh, positive 11, okay? So yeah, either way works. Okay, yeah, but we have our slope is 5, our point is 5, 30. Now we have enough information to get um, a linear equation here the equation of the tangent line. So y equals mx plus b. So we got our y value is 30 equals our slope value is 11 times 5 plus b. So that's 30 equals 55 plus b. So our b value is negative 25. You're okay now? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so that is, what is it all together? Uh, y equals 11x minus 25. That's the other equation of the tangent line that also passes through the point 2, negative 3. Okay. Now, one more thing that I wanted to mention before I... Uh, stop talking at you today is this little piece over here um, about uh, when you're talking about displacement, a function that represents displacement versus time. Okay, and how many of you guys are taking physics? Or how many people have taken some physics before? 
Okay, so do you guys know the difference, or people who haven't, maybe you remember from grade 10, what's the difference between distance and displacement? Does anyone know? Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So your displacement is um, at a certain time, how far are you from where you started? Yes, it's a vector, precisely. Displacement is the total amount of distance that you have actually traveled, right? So for example, uh, you know, I have this watch that counts my steps and all that kind of stuff. Some of you guys probably have this too. I get out of bed in the morning and then I end up in bed at night, right? My displacement from morning to night is zero. But if you look at my watch, I've, tra I've walked a lot of kilometers over the course of the day. That's my distance, okay? So, um, and uh, displacement is considered a vector. It has direction. So you can say your displacement is negative, for example, because negative means you're like to the left of where you started, right? Um, whereas distance is not negative. You're looking at absolute values if you're looking at distance, okay? Um, so if you're looking at a function that looks at displacement versus time, and you look at the derivative of that function, okay? Let's actually, before we talk about that, Let's look at distance versus time instead. Okay. What does the slope of distance versus time represent? I want you to, I know some of you guys know it, but think about it. Distance compared to time. Told you not to call it, okay, that's okay, yes. So distance compared to time is your speed, right? Kilometers per hour, meters per second, miles per hour, usually, okay? That kind of thing. So um, when you're looking at distance versus time, slope or rate of change, this is back to grade 10 stuff when you're looking at linear functions, the slope of a distance versus time graph represents the rate of change, kilometers per hour, is, is the speed. Okay. When you're looking at displacement versus time, displacement is now a vector. So there's direction involved. Okay. What is the vector form of speed? Velocity. So when you take the derivative of a function that represents displacement, that derivative represents the velocity compared to time. Okay, so we're looking at stuff with vectors. By the way, um, do you guys know what the derivative of velocity is? What's the rate of change of your velocity? Acceleration, yeah. So we're get, we talked a little bit about taking the second derivative of a function. If you take the first derivative of a displacement function, you're looking at the velocity of that displacement. If you take the second derivative, you're looking at the acceleration compared to time. And we're gonna look more at that a couple months from now, okay? But I think there are a couple of questions in your homework for today that specifically talk about displacement and the derivative of that. So derivative of displacement is velocity. Okay? Okay, so I'm gonna stop for today.